Hi there, my name is Muhammad, and I'm the host of the Reconfigured Podcast, a show that explores the intersection of technology, culture, and society. We bring professionals to talk about their extended experience or discuss about a specific topic that might interest the audience. All of our episodes are available for free, with no cost to the general public. Just a quick reminder that we are always on the lookout for interesting guests who can share their unique perspective on the topics we cover, or you can pitch in in a new topic to discuss on the pod. Just reach out to us on social media or apply to our available opportunities posted on Polywork. So welcome to the show. Today I'm with Wesley. Wesley, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Wesley Faulkner. I am a, a really tech nerd geek. I've been in the tech space for doing multiple roles for multiple decades. I'm super old. Um, but my current job is that I am the senior community manager at AWS. Uh, I'm also uh, on the board of South by Southwest. And I really love doing podcasts and talking to people. Okay. So before we dive deep into everything, you state you're a son of immigrants and a first generation American. As someone who is not US based, which I'm Middle Eastern actually, what does it mean to be a first generation American? Is it like it's the first wave of people who immigrated and became American? It means that my parents are immigrants. And so I am the first born in this country of my lineage and the different sides of my family. The reason why that's uh, kind of significant to me is because growing up in a multicultural household gave me a unique perspective to kind of understand how different people can act differently or have different customs. And the, the center of what some people would consider normal and some people considered odd are kind of all mixed up in my upbringing. And so it, it, I feel that it gave me a little about a flexibility of being more acceptance of differences. So as an acceptance, as in the terms of you understand different points of views and you can assess based on those points of views. Yes. And just more like finding an, where people are and then not expecting them to be where I am. Uh, so if they feel like you need to take your shoes off before you enter a house, I don't say, oh, those people are weird. I just understand that customs could be different upbringings can be different. The way of speaking, the way of kind of uh, presenting a topic can be received differently based on some one's personal experience. And that's okay. Um, there are many different ways um, to be um, considered acceptable. Uh, and there's a myriad of different ways of being offensive as well. And so uh, you got to hold both of those on, on uh, um, for each kind of conversation and types of interaction to make sure you give a good broad birth to make sure that um, you are kind of working in a way that is comfortable for both parties. So you currently work as a senior community manager at AWS. Your role constitutes of representing the company, which is AWS, to the public along with maintaining certain KPIs. What makes your role different from a developer advocate and developer relations, or when someone who worked in DevRel for a while ends up as a community manager, or mm -hmm. how does it work? Um, I think they're very similar, um, but I think a DA, um, if you talk about like upper echelon, the the influence of a DA once they reach a certain level level is that they can speak one to many, multiple times and often. And I think the upper echelon of a community manager is that they can speak one-to-one -one at scale. So being able to talk to individual community members, community leaders um, on a day-to-day -day basis is kind of the goal and what I, I want to do and what the goal of the personal interaction of really making what we do personal instead of scaling and generic. So what I do is very, very bespoke for the approach for each individual group or people as I talk to them. And I think 
going back to the previous skill of being able to kind of morph into different ways of communicating is assist me in doing that. So they're, they're very similar in that way. But uh, instead of really like promoting a product or showing the benefits of how the product can make your life easier, I show the benefits of working for a company at scale and leveraging those um, benefits to help people work smaller groups and uh, to inter communicate between what a community leader wants and what the members of those community need from that personal interaction. So you're mostly doing one to one kind of meetings with people. So yes, there's a completely different spectrum. Let's say as a developer relations, you would have to talk with multiple developers at an event or something like that. While my relation, let's say with you is like a one to one kind of thing I would do one-to-one -one meetings with you to discuss certain things as this? Yes. So interactions with me, um, I would say before would involve sending you to my slide deck, sending you to resources online. My one-to-one -one interaction with me in this role is me giving you my email address or giving you a calendar invite. So those, those are kind of the scale we're talking about in terms of the interaction in the current role. But the type of questions that I would ask you, let's say, as a community manager, so I'd come up and ask you about, let's say, something related, let's say, to AWS as a service, and you would tell me how I can make a company adopt this kind of thing as a community manager, or it's not, because I look at it as a perspective of a developer relations, you would come up and you ask them a mm -hmm. certain question, but what mm -hmm. type of questions I would come and ask you? Right. So the questions you, the example you use is how would a company adopt like aws but as a community leader or a person working in the community you might ask me the question of um, how do i understand this better and get resources so that it can help other people understand it better or how do i make it so that people can access this information easier so it's more of communicating ideas to people rather than communicating ideas to a company. Does that make sense? So, so it's more human centered, if you want to say very human centered. Yes. Okay. I'm going to move to a different question, which is, uh, you are a board member of the experience firm. This question will constitute multiple, uh, what does the experience firm offers and what is the role of being a board member when it comes to a company? Not necessarily, if you want to say about the experience firm. And does anyone who is knowledgeable, knowledgeable enough can become part of a board member or does it require a certain level that I have to go through, like either investing or an ideas or that? So experience, experience firm is a, a company that kind of focuses on experimental experiential marketing, uh, going to an event, meeting people, or producing a website that gives some sort of emotional connection and hook. Um, the way that I got involved in that company is that it's run by a really good friend of mine. Uh, and so I think that's kind of like a lot of ways that people get into boards is that um, you build that certain level of trust uh, is this, it's it, the a board is almost like a, another community where people can gather and feel trust that they are part of the same kind of cloth feather and have the same principles to um, put forth uh, a, a way forward for a company. Now, for for the experience firm. Um, what it consists of is a lot of just conversations. It's it's a loose board ship not in the formal board ship that you hear about from multiple companies where we all get together, we all have a meeting, we decide the direction of the company, but it's more of a, um, a person of counsel. So we speak, um, often and talk about how things are going and, uh, I'm activated as needed. So it's very, very cool, but also not as super serious because of it's like a, a, a group of friends that are just trying to make sure that the world is a better place and that we're, when we run into uh, hardships that we can lean on each other for advice.
usually like a board of members, there would be like an investor on board and you would yeah. be talking, let's say a CEO and a CTO and let's say a CFO with the investor who invested in the company or shareholders. They will start saying like certain KPIs and saying we need to achieve this or we're facing mm -hmm. this issue, how we need to face it. But in your case, I think it's just the, because you've done it with your friend. So it feels more of a, like a meetup, much more than it's a board uh, meeting. Yeah, I think uh, board is almost like the word CEO. I mean, I've, I've, I'm sure you've gone to multiple meetups and met people who are CEOs and they're only one person that works for the company and that's them. And uh, it's one of those, it, those terms where it can get thrown around and it sounds meaty or weighty, um, but depending on the context, it can vary from I just have a side hobby to I run a multi-million dollar um company um that that is that scales to to, to thousands uh, of users um but uh unfortunately that's this is not one of those on that side of the spectrum so i'm gonna move to a different question which is you worked as a head of community at single store which is a company that offers a database SaaS service to the public would you like to talk more about what single store is, uh, what they offer, and what is the adventures of being head of community there? So single store is a startup um, that was rebranded, um, I would say, the, about a year before I got there. And the the way that uh, the advantages of single store is that it is it could use be used as a um, transactional database, um, like a like a general RDMS like you would think of, but also has a high throughput um, for uh, analytics. So instead of uh, having to move to a specialized database for those types of analytics, um, you save on the transfer cost and um, by it being a column store and a roll store kind of in one. Um, and my role there was, since it was a startup, was to help with using community to kind of emphasize the advantages of the database to the group that find that type of use case more day-to-day -day in the way that they did work. So talk to a lot of people who uh, were CTOs or IT decision makers, and we had a, um, kind of like an influencer program where we got them in and uh, helped them to evangelize the product. We had a forum for people to discover other people who are using it and to lean on each other for problem solving if they ran into an issue with using the product or adapting it or doing a transfer from an older technology to, to that technology. But the, one of the, the, the things that I'm most proud of that I did at Single Store for Community was fostering internal community. Uh, different departments generally are siloed. So sales works and just does something. Tech support does something. Engineering does something. So I created some internal groups to help merge and break down the walls between those different departments so that we can put forth different efforts and uh, really develop the skills that each individual's team member might have, even though that they are different responsibilities are dramatically different. And so the, the name of this program was called the circle program where, um, we would have different initiatives since we were a startup to kind of, uh, things that we didn't have dedicated headcount for, but initiatives that the company had anyway, like blogging or social media posting or meetups. Um, I kind of asked different members of the company to raise their hand if they had those specific interests, created groups that met on a regular basis to figure out how can the company move these initiatives forward with your leadership. So they would create their own meetup account. They would uh, talk to their own customer base and friends and get them together um, and do a meetup for the meetup group. For the social group, they would talk about social strategy or how to get content and how to get their coworkers to make content to post on social. Um, for 
uh, the blogging group. They would talk about subjects that resonated with them and so on and so forth. So they're able to exercise their individual skills by um, really working through a plan for producing this kind of content or end result, but also to have these conversations where now engineering kind of knows some of the plights of sales and customer service knows the plights of engineering and so on and so forth. So there was like a communion and a community that was built internally that only, not only pushed these initiatives forward, but also made it so that uh, people were really getting to know how the company ran and kind of what are the struggles of the day-to-day -day for people who just do a different job than they do. That's actually the thing with every single company is that each department is actually siloed and they do it because they don't want to interfere you while doing your work. But the thing is, is that the ironic thing that most of the innovations happen in those kind of circles. So let's say for example, someone in the design team decided it's like, Hey, I have this idea for a cool feature on, let's say the product. And they would come up and talk with the engineering team, telling them like, Hey, I have this idea. How about we can implement it? And those kind of things happen between mm -hmm. the employees, not ra rather much more than the creator of the startup itself, because they see the product itself. Yeah, I think that's why Apple had or built that Starship campus, a, a, a ring so that there is more interaction between different people instead of different sections and different walls. And I hear that some companies even put like bathrooms in certain locations so they force employees to kind of intermingle. So those situations of serendipity happen more often. But this kind of like serendipity for big companies makes sense since it's a big company, but for a startup, they, they might fear, let's say the founder of the startup might afraid that some of the software developers that one of the designers and one of the salespeople to get, let's say a certain idea of the product and offer something on behalf of the startup. So I'll give you like an example. If let's say you're offering service A and the engineers who are developing service A got the idea, but they realized, okay, how about if we can take service A and do service B? but we might leverage the designer and the salespeople. So now they have a startup and they move away from the startup. Mm -hmm. So because it negatively impacts this startup, which is like, which offering service A. So some companies will eventually want to silo those employees so they don't meet each other. What, what you're saying is that's the power of the company imposing it on the people rather than the company understanding that that is a great resource and finding a way to channel it. So it's not a failure of the people, but a failure of leadership. If they feel that having people create new ideas uh, is a harm because they have a failure to harness those ideas or listen to those ideas. And so um, yes, totally that can happen. And that is a fear that some companies have, but companies that operate out of fear of coming out with new ideas tend to uh, languish because of the lack of innovation. Um, if you foster innovation and you foster clear and open communication, um, then you can try to like make sure that harm doesn't ever come to pass. Um, I think that's why Google and other companies have like 20% time or innovation hubs or ways that where people can migrate these ideas to different laboratories to kind of test them out to see how they work out. Um, at AWS, we have this culture of bias for action, which is that if we see something that we think could be great, then we are empowered individually to kind of see it through and get it done. But I would like AWS, if let's say for an example, I would think of a service and if I gather people, there might be a chance that becomes an actual AWS service. Yep. I, I might write a document circulated with around a few people. We both do revisions and challenge each other and do edits. And, uh, and then we say, this is great. This is amazing. And then we can then work about how we're going to launch it, what resources we need. And then we are empowered to say, let's bring this up a level. Let's go ahead and get this done. Or we have a critical mass and it's less of convincing and more like presenting, like this is already like baked and we're ready to pull the trigger. And that kind of culture is the kind that fost is fostered at the company. 
So I'm going to move to a different question, which is you worked as a developer advocate at DailyCo and a developer relation advocate at IBM. What is the difference between a developer advocate and a developer relation advocate? And does the same role differ between each company or it's just the same role, but like different naming? So I would say that those are the same terms, but it's almost changes from company to company. Uh, like the CEO example, where uh, it's a title that people recognize, but maybe it's enacted in a different way. Um, at IBM, it's a, it's a huge, massive company. And so uh, a DA there is a lot different than daily where I joined where uh, I was a 17th employee. So um, there's a lot more hats that you wear for, at a smaller company um, and more responsibility um, and also more freedom to create and to kind of set direction. With IBM, things were a little bit more settled of what the goals were and how to obtain them. So the structure was dramatically different, but I would say, generally speaking, uh, being the face and voice of the company and representing that externally, taking feedback from the community and bring it in internally, um, were both core to my roles at, at either job. So the when you say when you're working at a startup, you have to wear different hats, but when you wear when you work in a corporate, it's already defined for you what you need to do, so it's just much more easier. Is that correct? Well, easier in a way. For instance, if I made a video at IBM, I there was a process for getting that video edited. There was a process for coming up with the graphic visuals that would be overlaid. There was a process for representing the brand. There was a process for creating the copy that would go with the video. There was a process for getting it posted online. There was a po process for getting paid boosts for that. All those processes, each individual kind of has their own lane. And my role was to hand it off, which means that each of those processes could take time. And if you want to deviate from that process, you're more restricted. But if I did the same thing at a smaller company, I might own every part of those steps, but then I have to do them and it could take longer. But I also do have some leeway of exactly how it would be executed. Does that make sense? So it's more about your sacrificing structure for the sake of freedom. So at the corporate, you have, you have to follow a certain thing you don't control most of the elements, but you control the element that you're assigned to. Whereas in the startup, you have to do everything, but you have full ownership on how things are going to happen in details. But it takes yes. much more effort to do to do. Yes, and that's just an example. And so, yeah, absolutely. So you, you could choose to experiment and play more, tweak little things here and there of your own workflow. You can do color correction if you want. You can choose not to, white balance. All the editing stuff, you could just skip a few steps. Or you can just like do a short form and I just want to get it out there just because this is a time sensitive kind of media or the topic that I'm talking about. Those, you have more flexibility and more play. Um, but once again, you still have to do all the work and then you have to choose how you're going to prioritize that as opposed to a larger company where you can just throw it over the wall saying, my part's done, you take care of it and I'll move over to the next thing. So I'm gonna to move to a different question, which is you worked as a technical community manager at MongoDB. When we talk about community management, does it differ what community management a company might aim for? So I'm asking this question because community management differs itself within itself and the company like, you might be a community manager that does everything related PR wise, or you might be a technical community manager that handles technical aspect for the company's community wise. So I think this question differs when, let's say you're working at a startup level and a company level. So I would aim for the corporate level since MongoDB is a, I don't think MongoDB is a, is a startup anymore. It's a company. No, they're public. Yeah. Yeah. So the company. So they are public. So your aim as a technical community manager at MongoDB is more like handling the community itself on a technical level or is something else? 
it's both um let me give you it's it's not just um it's kind of also like community ops would be i would say a good portion of it too so not just managing the community but the actual infrastructure and tooling for the community is a big part of it too um, the planning of how it's going to be executed what the workflow is from moving into a, a problem or an issue with the community both from a member posting on the, a forum or something and saying they have a problem but also uh, outages or maintenance or feature sets or skimming and all that stuff all that comes with uh I would say that role as well. So if you if you combine kind of like community ops and community, and then merging them together, that's I would say that would be the it, for that role specifically that kind of encapsulates what makes the the technical part of the technical community manager. So not just being able to hear a question and understand the technical makeup and see if it's severity or, or and, and put it in context in order for them to get the right right resources. But also understanding like how do we surface and how do we do the analytics to make sure that we pull the right data from the community and we have the right um, runway to make sure that the community is being served by the tools that we give them. I'm going to focus on community ops. That's a new term that the first time I'm hearing it. Would you like to elaborate more on this if you want? Just like DevOps and, um, and you have different tooling like CI, CD, you choose what kind of pipeline you're going to do to make sure that you do your testing appropriately and that the developers can be kind of uh, like the friction is reduced, but also the quality is improved. The same thing with community. Um, you, you look at the sign-in process, you look at the uh, profile uh, creation, you look at how you flag issues, uh, you look at making sure the terms of service uh, raises the safety from the interaction of each user. You kind of look at the whole thing holistically from the journey of the, the community member and making sure that that works as seamlessly as possible and that they're able to express themselves in the way that makes sense. Uh, so creating a section for off-topic discussions would be a way to kind of clean up the, the Q&A part of the forum and making sure that there is a place for them to put those things that don't fit and making sure that there's a way to, to like flag like curse words if that's something you're concerned about or flag really like sentiment, negative sentiment saying like crashed or deleted or production down, like the things that are really should have more attention so that you can on the community side, like behind the scenes, make sure that those are handled the way that they're expected. So some of it is invisible, some of it is very visible, but the, that's, I would say, kind of the same way that you would think of DevOps, you would apply it to community. So let's say for an example, you have a specific workflow and a specific, uh, I'm gonna say this, architecture of handling mm -hmm. the community. So you would do it as this kind of thing, you would cut, let's say the form into a parts for the Q&A, so it handles the Q&A part. You filter out the form from the things that there are bad things. And then you would take, uh, you would create a different segment for other people to, let's say, pitch in an idea or pitch in a feature. Mm -hmm. You would handle all of these, but without, uh, I'm going to say this, you try to make it as friendly and more humane as possible and not to be cluttered with spam or stuff that might affect. Like, let's say, for example, if something's wrong, I would ask on the question side, I would get a Q&A or I might send like a private message in the mm -hmm. form and it might be resolved. Whereas in other companies, they might don't have this kind of thing. So they might resolve to put it in the Q&A section. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you also uh, go a step further and look at the escalation process, um, not just for issues, but for um, like, some sort of changes like deploying slack as a community as opposed to discord or something like that uh how how do you handle those types of conversations um, um if you know the roadmap of the the product or service that you are in charge of making sure that you make that you find a way to ingratiate that with the community do we have like a, a critical incident 
section uh, on the blog post? Do we have a way to like, let's say if there's a huge security breach, how does the community handle that in terms of making sure that people have an outlet to complain or to even escalate issues if they're affected? So community conversations in a more holistic way that works with all the different functionings of the company um, so that there that what would happen organically is kind of like accelerated um, by being responsiveness responsiveness in, internally. Um, so it's 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 adaptive and it's a way to make sure that friction um, from the user perspective once again is just reduced to the to the high to the lowest level and the quality is increased so that you get the most out of it if you're a new user or an existing user. So uh, can you give like a type of instructions if let's say a startup want to implement a community ops kind of thing? So if I want uh, to create a new startup, yeah. I want to create a section for the community itself. Let's say you're starting it out. What would you recommend starting with and what should I do in details if you want to? Okay, first thing you do, um, is go to either like LinkedIn or Indeed and hire someone who knows what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> because tips and trips are just like, there, there's no formula. That's why it's very, very hard. But um, the way that you implement a community from a fresh new company that no one's heard of and you're kind of launching is different than a company that um, let's say has been working on the engineering side and putting it out there and testing it or even open source and then you bolt on a community. So just say those are two different things. Um, if you are developing with the community, a manager like this, one of your first hires before you even come out of stealth, the first thing I would say is work with uh, the person on a, a peer level. Uh, sometimes people think that we make the decisions, the decisions come down and then they go to the community and the community needs to do whatever they're gonna do. But the community um, needs to have input or the community manager needs to have input in the shaping of the company and the shaping of the process and the dissemination of information and the decision of what features and uh, uh, what the roadmap and how they're going to line up in the future. And this, this part feels kind of, why would you put someone on the same level as that, as someone who does these decisions or actually putting fingers to keyboard to code this? Um, is because of what I said before of the synergy that needs to happen and that connection needs to start at the beginning. If you are a company that's bolting on community, that is some way an advantage and a little bit of a disadvantage. Disadvantage is you don't have that cohesion that I talked about before in the previous scenario. But the other advantage is that the community manager can kind of put the finger on the pulse of what the reaction and feeling of the community as they received the existing product out in the market and just try to tailor the experience around the existing kind of reaction and feedback and wants and needs of the community. So it's in a listening position initially to figure out how do we best serve the community? And after that work with management or the executive team to make sure that that type of kind of production can happen and will be supported. So getting executive buy-in early is needed at that point. And so once you have those two constructions and you're looking to move into community ops, it's imp imperative that the community manager really say that, really talk about what the final vision of the community is. What is the end result? When is the definition of done? When do we get to the point where we say, this is what we want the community to look like? And then be realistic about the type of resource investment that'll need to be, whether it's uh, financial uh, tool sets or engineering saying like, we need to either create some of these tools or we need to alter the roadmap to make sure that this community impact is placed higher on the priority list of the roadmap and timeline. And so that type of influence on that is something that the community manager would need to do in order to do community ops to make sure that's responsive to the community and the community builds trust in the symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, and then explore tooling and explore reporting to make sure that the community is monitored, not just success and growth, but happiness and efficiency. Uh, and then 
rinse and repeat over and over again. So for an example, when you said about getting satisfaction from people understanding the community, you might reach the position, you might value the community more than the product at some level, since their feedback would be. The community manager is the person representing the need and the community and have that feeling. Yes, you could have, and if you, that's why the, the really good, so like solid commitment and relationship early on is important because the community manager may be in some cases diametrically opposed to what like a product owner might want. And they have to be able to find a way to work through that conflict and that uh, disagreement in a healthy, robust way that they can hear each other and understand each other. And so that the correct decision can be made. Uh, so yes, the community manager should value the community over the product. So the community manager, let's say, gets the feedback from the people from the community. He would have, let's say, a list of requirements and he would come up to, let's say, to the product owner or the product manager and tells them like the community requested these amount of features. Is there, is any of those features are feasible and you would organize on making those features become an actual part of the product or is there a process for this? Oh, I mean. Hopefully there is. And so when, when you hear from the community, if you have an experienced community manager, they're not just getting this list and aggregating the list, but they're actually doing their due diligence to understand the significance of these features and requests. Um, I'm sure all of us who's ever been on social media know that sometimes the loudest voices are not sometimes the most prominent. Um, and sometimes it's, uh, people requesting features for a solution of a problem where they don't understand either the feature already exists or that there, there's more elegant way to solve that problem. Uh, there's a quote from Henry Ford. He's like, if I asked people what they want, I would, they would say a faster horse instead of a car that sometimes that their imaginations are limited to their current framework of thinking. And so being able to dissect, kind of these, um, these stories or these problem sets are sometimes more important than getting actual feature requests because understanding where the problem exists um, means that there's some flexibility of how they're enacted and how they show up in the product. So I'm going to move to a different question, which is you have worked as a marketing and communication manager and social media manager. Those roles aren't technical in the sense that they are more managerial based roles. When someone who wants to shift towards DevRel or related roles, having a background in marketing and social media plays a role in advancing to get a DevRel job since DevRel relies on PR and communication at some level. Um, I'm going to push back and say that they're, that they weren't, that they are technical in some ways. Um, but, um, when, when, in order to communicate ideas, you kind of have to understand it in order to break it down, to move it into other people's frameworks of how they currently work in order to change behavior. Um, marketing is, is at its core kind of like behavior adjustment or change. Either someone's using another product or they're using your product and you want them to upgrade to the newest version of the product. So understanding how they use the product and how it applies to their lives, I think is in a way very technical to be able to dissect that from that point of view, especially if you're talking about working for a, a, pro a company that works in the technical realm. So that is, of course, like you said, yes, I agree. That's very transferable to multiple skill sets of being able to digest and regurgitate something uh, in several different forms, um, that's applicable to different demographics and different, uh, levels of either complexity or understanding. But sometimes like the dev row might reach to a position tells you like, okay, I'll refer you to, let's say an evangelist that can help you with this technical thing. Mm -hmm. So there are some times that the dev row might reach to a position that says, okay, I might not have a solution for it, but someone in the evangelist team or someone else in the software development team can fit in. Because uh, when we're talking about technical, there's a decent amount of people who are in the tech space, but they cannot communicate the idea properly. 
-hmm. So you might be good at writing code, but you might not be good at convincing, let's say, someone else to use a service or to understand what they want exactly from, let's say, a certain service to approve on it. Yes, but you still need to know enough to know to send to the right person. So uh, I'm sure that several of us have called customer service or something and been redirected or forwarded to multiple people because that person didn't fully understand the issue. Um, and so there needs to be at least some level of wide understanding of the topic in order to send them to the specialists on one specific vertical. So yes, uh, totally agree on that point. So you worked as a social media and community manager at Atlassian. Atlassian offer a range of services from Bitbucket to Jira. Would you like mm -hmm. to talk about, about your role there and what you did there? So my role there, um, I was hired because there's this startup that was really grabbing the attention of a lot of like uh, technical communities. Um, and this startup was called Slack and people were adopting Slack left and right. So I was hired as the kind of social media and community manager for, for um, the rival product that Atlassian owned, which was called HipChat. So HipChat was born before Slack um, and then acquired by Atlassian. Um, and it kind of was a good connection between uh, connecting several different Atlassian services, um, but it was still very niche at the time. Um, and Slack was kind of getting the attention that uh, HipChat wanted. Uh, and so I was hired to kind of like harness this space that is becoming more popular, which is corporate instant messenger over email and um, being able to use that as a task um, uh, aggregator for different types of departments or groups of people. So the social side was I played on Twitter a lot. I wrote blog posts. And I tried to like kind of evangelize like why ZipChat was, was awesome and why email was just kind of like a chaotic inbox. By the way, I stand by that statement. Email is just a, like a flat empty box with no context and makes it chaotic to try to organize um, without a lot of rule sets that is basically put on the onus of the, the receiver rather than um, on the sender. But I digress from that point. Um, and so a lot of what I did there was the online work, but was paired with, um, this was based in Austin, Texas with, was paired with the local community and working with community groups. I even converted some of the, the, the office space into a meeting space for meetups from people in the tech community in Austin. Um, so we had people come in, we had groups gather there. And so it was kind of like a, 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 a gratis a benefit for people who are in the, the tech space in, in Austin to, to know that they can have a place that was free and that we would even sponsor with like refreshments and, um, and help make sure that they were taken care of with from AV to a stage to chairs. And um, I would go to an event and really just talk about like the advantages of using uh, organizational tools that fit the size of the community and the needs of the community. So that's kind of my role, both physical and virtual. Plus, so you were trying to say that HipChat was way beyond its time at that time. Uh, I could say that it, it, I'll just say it, it missed its moment. <laughs> um, so, yeah. It made sense, actually, for Atlassian to adopt this kind of thing since you can pair your Bitbucket commits with Jira and the chat within itself. Because now you do it exactly the same on Slack. So on Slack, you would yeah. actually pin the Bitbucket uh, with the Jira ticket, the name of it, and it will automatically links it to it. And then you have this plugin of Jira plugin and Bitbucket on Slack, and you can get the same result. Yeah. And also for incident management, it would, like if something went down, it would auto-generate a room for you with every stakeholder um, who were like either on call or uh, had a decision in what next actions would be. Uh, and you can choose to force ping those people. So it's kind of like pager duty um, to go like 
this is an incident we all need to be all hands on deck on this it had a lot of great features um it it there was a there was an at here that came out first before slack um before slack you would have to just do at channel and just ping everyone who's in the channel but um pinging everyone who was just online with at here was um was in hip chat first um there's a lot of innovation that happened in hip chat that um that slack kind of like uh, also got influenced and i think vice versa too i think there's a lot of features that slack had that hip chat didn't that hip chat then later incorporate so it was a good rivalry i think we both pushed each other to be a little bit better and then atlassian put it in the grave and ended it i'd say the official um tr like history of it is that they pivoted to a new code base uh, called it something else um and then but that new code base didn't have all the features of the old code base even though that was more resilient and then eventually it was acknowledged that slack was the leader and the ip got transferred over to slack and atlassian put an investment into slack as um as saying like we are granting you not only this ip but uh, a cash flow injection because we believe in in what the work you're doing so i'm going to move to a different question which is you worked in several roles at amd ranging from product management engineer to evangelist then university recruiter would you like to talk more about this and does the shift from one role to another come due to an opportunity or request or due to fill gaps in the company so i feel like amd is the kind of those companies where they have like a million roles and they might just fit you into them so for the for the record i was a product development engineer the whole entire time but i also did like side hustles in the company and so um part of it is because of requests that came for me because of like my skill set part of it is like things i kind of like pursued but i would think all of it is due to my adhd and uh being needing to to be distracted by something interesting um so those those the passion of university recruiting is uh, i met someone who did that and said that you know you should go out and uh kind of talk to college students about the advantages and help recruit them over to AMD and i said yeah i love talking to people let's do that um same with being an evangelist i love talking to people let's do that <laughs> and uh so a lot of the roles that i did was like finding a way that balance between being like in a room or in a lab working on something but also finding ways to have outlets that are still kind of officially related to the company to be able to do that kind of public relations and public engagement that I love to do. So I was just trying to keep myself busy and happy at the same time. So you took the idea of shit wearing different hats in corporate and startup. Yes, absolutely. Um the the some of it was extremely organic. Um like when I became a social media evangelist, I was one of the first people on Twitter in the company. Uh, because I loved it and I love talking about my job. I I like I said when I said I was a geek, I I am a geek. I love technology. And so I talk about my like from not from a confidential standpoint, but just like from um a public standpoint. We just released this this driver. This driver allows you to do or turn on these features or we um uh have this new uh CPU release, uh new graphics card release and and i would just really talk about the things that i loved and i was passionate about or excited about or things that were coming up uh in the future uh like if i was going to go to ces i would talk about how it would be at ces or another conference on behalf of the company and that type of organic engagement from a corporate social standpoint was relatively new um I, i i was since i was on twitter from the early days there wasn't a lot of corporate representation it was just people and being a person talking about a corporate stand from an insider's point of view was very very rare and um kind of help i would say boost at least my profile the prominence about those who cover the industry so analysts reporters that type of thing which kind of triggered kind of influx of people reaching out to me asking for official comment 
from the company where I wasn't official. And so that kind of made it so that I was kind of forced to get PR trained, forced to be able to answer and respond to those types of issues, working with the marketing team to make sure what I was doing was still on brand or uh, on the right topping points. And so that's kind of what moved me into that position because I was kind of just out there just doing the thing that I loved. So it's more like, it's not a generic post. It's just a human being actually posting about something that he actually likes doing. So yeah. it's more like, it's more like a kid when he just discovered like, Oh, look at this. This is what I discovered. And yeah. But on a big scale. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it was an outlet. Once again, I was stuck behind a desk a lot. So I love people. And I'm like, if I could take something and like fling it out to the world to hopefully get some sort of response, that was something I was like severely like looking for. And I loved, um, I love being able to like, just not see something cool and not share it. I wanted to share it. I wanted to feel like I could like have an outlet for joy. That's actually the same thing I do with the podcast. It's like I sit on a desk every day. It's like you get bored even when, let's say, writing code and attending mm -hmm. meetings and replying to emails. You reach a position like, I need to do something. Yeah. It's like it's completely wild and just fun and have fun doing it. It's like I don't care. I just love doing it, but I just right. want to do it. Yeah. Or just I need a reaction. I don't care if it's positive or negative, but I just I want to push and pull of working with someone or even arguing with someone on a certain issue. Like, let me have some sort of reactive type of engagement rather than something that's very static where I just push the code into a computer screen all day. Yeah, it's just boring. It's very rare to find even someone in the company that you can discuss certain things with. Like most of them, it's like, oh, okay, I just came here to work and that's it. And it's like, hey, do you see this new thing? It's like, it's pretty cool. But like, we don't have time for that. Can we just focus exactly. on work? Yes. Um, and that's the same thing with like community. You got to figure out those bonds between people that goes outside of that general common domain. You need multiple points of connection and um, correlation to either to, to be able to feel like, all right, this person is someone I can I can really connect with. But have you reached a position like, let's say, as a developer relation and community manager, have you ever used a reference for something completely weird to explain something for someone? So let's say a TV show All the time. or... All the time. Oh, oh really? Do you want to give like <laughs> well, an example? I, I mean, like Henry Ford and Horst to like a form request for features. I mean, come on. I, 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 my brain works in a way that it kind of like finds connections and makes things make sense. Um, so... Um, I, I, it's, it's more like I can, it's hard for me to think of a time because I do it often. Um, one viral thread that I had on developer relations was showing the relationship between Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, between having like a fixed set of things that need to be, um, secure in order to move up to the next rung of next level thinking and how, and developer marketing you can't just necessarily say, I'll give you a $25 gift card to come to my booth or do some sort of action. It's because you connect um, where what food, shelter, safe, that kind of thing is the hierarchy of needs um, that developers are higher up on the rung because most of them are compensated fairly well to the point where they move beyond understanding or really focusing on money or that because that's all taken care of. Everything is pretty settled at that point. Um, they're more thinking about like, how do I get further in my career? How do I get, how, do, how am I well liked? How do I understand myself better? Um, how do I um, really move towards the things that are um, like, that, that are gonna make me a better person? And so that's kind of the thing in terms of what drives and what engages them is gonna be on higher in that rung. And so that's why, uh, having a booth where someone were saying, I'll give you $25 to, to fill out a survey. You're like, it's not worth it to me. Cause I'm not looking, I'm not really fighting for $25. I'm fighting for understanding and I'm fighting for um, really like making my life easier or better. But when they say something to the kin of, we can reduce compile time or reduce errors, or even just say we can use like chat GPT to help you ideate quicker. And you're like, that is going to make my life easier. That is going to save me time. That is going to actually enhance 
what I already do and how that is more of a compelling statement than the gift card. Actually, I tried to use ChatGPT for the podcast. For like uh, the questions or like... Uh, yeah, yeah, or... the questions. Point. So what I did actually, uh, I did like a PR stunt using ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. So what I did is that I wanted to get someone who's a very high profile for the podcast. And I... Oh, mission get... accomplished. I am here. Uh, also, I did this PR stunt on someone else, uh, mm -hmm. which is the co-founder of Anrami, which is the biggest music company in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about ChatGPT. And I was like, I wrote a question on ChatGPT. I was like, hey, ChatGPT, I want to get the co-founder of Anrami. Can you write me a proposal? And he wrote me a proposal. And what I did, I screenshotted it. I posted it on LinkedIn and I tagged him. And he was like, okay, I'll do a pod. See? There you go. <laughs> it works. Yes. It, it, but, it can work, uh, but, uh, but, but keep in accuracy. mind, it doesn't work at scale. Yeah. Yeah. But the accuracy of ChatGPT, I, I tried it before they start putting uh, limitations on him. Now, if you ask him the same question, he will say, uh, I don't answer this. But before, he actually used to answer and he used to fetch information that he wasn't fed in. Because here's the thing. ChatGPT It's not a he, though. Just, just, no, no. Just, it, it's an it. It's an it. It's in it. Yeah. So ChatGPT uh, they, states that the information that ChatGPT has is from 2021. Okay. Mm -hmm. I started the podcast in 2022 and he gave me the best punchline for the podcast without even knowing about it. Yes. It, it does that very well. I had it write my bio. It's saying write a biography for, for, for Wesley Faulkner. And it is like, it was all made up, of course, <laughs> but it was like, oh, that's really compelling. It's really great that they could use technology these days to kind of like really get you a good place to start, even if it's not true, but be able to give you, like I said, that ideation part where like, how do I get started? How do I tweak this so that it is like a little bit more compelling or more sounds like it's coming from me. And these tools, even if they're super technical, um, I think has crossed that chasm where it's moved into the zeitgeist, where it's not just people in technology talking about it, but just you'll see it on the news, you'll see it in like headlines from non-tech publications. Um, maybe friends might come up to you as like, what is this chat T GPT thing? Like, uh, because I think it's, it's extremely transformative. But wouldn't you fear like some people, let's say, start using ChatGPT for developer relations? So instead of writing documentation, you will tell ChatGPT, hey, there's this product X, can you write me a proper documentation on, or would you write me something that would relate to this person or if this person faced this issue? How would I solve it? Would you expect like future people would start doing this? Well, not to promote a podcast that we're recording for community polls, but that is going to be one of the big core questions of what is the intersection of this generative AI with developer relations when some of the things that you think about what developer relations do and can it be replaced? Um, but also realize um, that a people who, who are in developer relations as well, that a lot of work that they do is public. And I think using it as a tool to do your work. Also, I think in the future, it might be used as a tool to steal all the work <laughs> that people who are in developer relations have done and to create like almost copies of simulations of, or uh, similarities of what people in developer relations would do. Um, so that's something we need to address. Uh, the possibilities are, are endless, but I think we get to the point where as a society, once the tools get good enough and widely used, then it increases the pie instead of feeling like it's a replacement of the pie. When we got rid of elevator operators and there's all automated for people to use the elevator it, it it did eliminate that job but people just people now aren't saying well there's a huge percentage of the population that would be working on elevators but can't anymore because there's no those no jobs no they're doing something else and they're probably doing something that that um didn't even exist like developer relations let's let's go back i don't know two three decades ago that didn't exist there's going to be Technology begets more jobs, more opportunities to figure out how people and humans can use technology. And there's going to always be humans operating the technology, maybe from afar, maybe from close up, 
but there is still going to be some human to human interaction that ev even if some of the things that I use it for, um, once again, if, if you, if you're technical to know the vast array of what knowledge is out there, like I was talking about before, you can use the tools that are more appropriate. So it, there might be general purpose AI in the, in the far future, but still right now there might be AI that's going to be good at certain things rather than uh, good at all things. And there's going to need to be a human to be able to send it to those places of the domains that are going to be uh, more accurate to what you're trying to outcome to be. And so if, if I'm able to even use AI to generate a, a talk, uh, if, if it's able to generate slides, if it's able to generate um, proposals, everything, I'm, I doubt that you would go to a conference that is 100% AI generated. You'd rather still have a person present that information or be able to connect with you from a human perspective to give that information. There's a reason why we do these podcasts rather than people just reading on their own. This is perspective from a human perspective uh, and from a, a, a background that's going to be different from what they, they know of. And if we're all, if a, a G, a, AI is pulling from the same pool of information, pool of thought, it'll become more homogenous over time rather than more diverse. There's a sentence I've heard online, which is you don't fear ChatGPT, you fear the person who is using ChatGPT. So it's, it's more like you start to feel the person who starts using the AI because now he has an upper lever on you who can use it to his own advantage at some levels. Yes, this is an arms race between people um, using it for good or for ill, but it's still um, some of its first mover, just people are just doing it first. And, but eventually it'll catch up and everyone will start using it for ill or for good. And it's just an arms race between figuring out what they're using it for, figuring out how to mitigate that, and then do this new thing that's for good. And then other people will figure out how to mitigate that from the negative points and back and forth, like uh, social people are using it for social engineering uh, in order to like get into uh, people's protected files. There's there's a lot of different ways. Um, I for spam, you could use it to change and more adapt to spam filters by working through that using AIs. People and then also people are using it for like SEO optimization. So it's being able to spread like using like the algorithms that are out there. So it's the computers fighting computers and it's a, a tale as old as the internet and it's still just going to continue and just form. The, the thing is, is that the, te the thing is, is that the technology itself is fascinating, similar to how social media began. Like some people were using it for good and some people using it for ill. We still have it to this day, but it's about the technology itself was very fascinating on its own. Mm -hmm. That's, that's yes. the thing with it. Absolutely. Agreed. So I'm going to move to a different question, which is in 2016, you've decided to run for city council. What made you take this decision? And if you got elected and stayed there for a while, that would have changed your career path in a different way? Absolutely. Um, yeah, there's a lot of steps that led to that. Um, also in my bio, it shows that I was one of the co-founders of Open Austin, which was a uh, a group that came together to try to open source the data that the city collected so that we could use it in applications and um, be able to report on what was going on. For instance, uh, being able to open, one of the first projects was open sources, the, the 311 data, which is like people reporting on potholes or little things that are non-emergencies, but um, the city needed to, to use city services to either address or repair. And so we wanted to be able to make applications as a wrapper so people can do that easier, um, like an API to, to push and pull that information. Um, and that was kind of like my first foray into really understanding how government worked local, on a local level. Um, and then I went through this program called Leadership Austin. Now, Leadership Austin um, was, a, was basically seeing Austin from different facets, from the art perspective, from the education perspective, from the demographic and growth, from 
uh, from climate change, all of these different perspectives, kind of like really understanding how the city operated and the kind of challenges that are um, ahead for the population. And a lot of people who went through the Leadership Austin uh, training graduated and then eventually went into city council. And so that also reinforced that kind of idea. And a lot of people that go through the program are leaders, uh, at least locally. So a lot of people who run nonprofits, a lot of people who are teachers, a lot of people who are lawyers or judges um, and uh, media publications, a lot of people who are uh, in their own right, very successful. So having visions of being able to make changes and actually really help forge a better path for the city was something that didn't feel kind of far off and felt very tangible. So that kind of gave me the thought of running for city council. And it's not just um, the power, but also the purpose. Um, where I lived in Austin, it felt like the that it wasn't getting some of the advantages of the tech giants being there. There were uh, transportation problems. There were housing issues. There were uh, really depressed wages. There were things that really needed changes. And I didn't feel that the representative in my district was bringing those forth or really highlighting those. Um, and so that's why I decided to run in 2016. But if, let's say, for example, if you ran and you actually went there, would this actually put a restriction on your tech career? Would have ended oh, it? Oh, absolutely. It... Yeah. Yeah, right. I Is probably there... wouldn't have. Yeah. So um, after that, I was still, during that time, I was still doing social media marketing, I think, for tech companies. Um, so I don't know if I would, I, so I would never probably be in developer relations if I took that path in, in that direction. Uh, I would probably kind of just stay in, uh, more of the local tech space in Austin. Um, I would try to understand um, how to appeal and connect with those companies and be very centric in the constituents of the community rather than the users of those products. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely would have done or, and been a totally different person. But when you say about Austin, Texas, when in 2016 is way much different than now, because there are some tech companies opening in Austin, Texas mm -hmm. for yes. some of the benefits that it has now. Yes, but I am not late. I'm not lobbying on behalf of the local community that are outside their, um, their focus. Uh, I'm not seeing how they can, them as companies can be better citizens of Austin, Texas. I am, that's, that's not my job per se, something I'm interested in, of course, but, uh, I would say that there's a difference between wanting to do something day to day and, uh, it's coming from your core focus than someone who, um, is kind of like marginally interested in it and their core, for, core focus is something totally different. Um, so yes, companies are still moving to Austin. Uh, I moved away from Austin uh, and uh, I moved to mul uh, multiple places. And um, uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't have moved away from Austin if I also was on city council. So, yeah, it's just like uh, letting someone else kind of like in the, I mentioned like big corporate structure. I'll just, I, I still have some of my wants and needs, but I kind of just throw it over the wall to someone whose dedicated role or job is to take care of those things. So I'm going to move to a different question, which is, uh, as someone who's been in the tech industry for a very long time, 20 years, actually, as you stated on your LinkedIn, would you recommend to someone who is starting in DevRel to be, what would you recommend to someone who's starting in DevRel? And would you recommend this person to start in software development, then switch to DevRel, or is there a different way to do things? Depending on what you want to do and why, what is the driver? Um, but um, I think you, it's best to have some sort of understanding of the people that you're trying to serve. Um, kind of like I was a, a, a person living in Austin in a district and I wanted to serve the people who are in my district. Um, if you are going to be talking to software developers, you should probably be a software developer. 
if you are going to be talking to students, make sure, make sure you probably have been a student or gone through the student experience. Um, if you want to talk to startups, make sure you've been through the startup process. Um, there are multiple avenues. Uh, most of them in developer relations are related to software. And I would say doing some software development on some sort of level uh, is going to be advantageous to you. Um, and there's multiple ways to do software. Luckily, these days, you could go to school. You can learn to be a, learn through CS or for me, I was in electrical computer engineering. Um, you can go through a boot camp and uh, learn specific technologies uh, in web development or Rust or whatever you want to specialize in. Um, but you could also be a hobbyist where you look up YouTube videos, tutorials, advent of code projects, be totally self-paced and still have that experience. Um, you could also, a lot of my knowledge was through being adjacent to developers. So I, I was had an experience in multiple companies where I also worked with people directly who are doing this day to day. And so I was kind of embedded into this experience. And so that also influences a lot of uh, my knowledge even to this day. So there are multiple avenues. I would say the closer you are to the demographic you want to serve, it will allow you to have better alignment. Um, and so that I would, I would really try to impress the importance of making sure that you can really, really relate to the people you're talking to. But some people might shift, let's say to a different role. So they might start with the, let's say work as a software developer, then switch to a different role because sometimes that other role might pay more than just writing code at some level and less writing code. So when you're in developer relations, you're not writing every single day code mm -hmm. at some level. So mm -hmm. it, it's more like a managerial work, if you want to think about it. You will be helping people with code at some level, but you're not writing it every single day. So some people yeah. might realize that, uh, some people might realize like, okay, I can do this role shift and I would get to pay not to write that much code. That's more like a compromise just to take a break from writing code at some level. I think no matter what you do, if you're very good at it and you love it, you could be successful. And successful, of course, is subjective. So that I think w what works best is to lean into the thing that is your passion and the thing that you love to do. If you love to write code and talk to people, do both. If you love to just write code and not talk to people, just do that. If you love managing and that's where you want to work towards, move and work on a path to get you towards that. If you're just being motivated by money, I think if you're successful at anything, you'll get to the point of that Maslow pyramid where money is no longer an issue. And now you're stuck doing the thing that you want to get better at, make you more efficient. And if you're optimizing for the wrong thing, when you get to that point, you've that's where you have people who burn out or totally switch careers and saying, yeah, I made my money doing this, but I'm going to be doing this um, now that I have this pile of money, I don't have to worry about it, but now I'm going to open a, a wine vineyard or uh, like raise strays uh, or rescue animals or whatever. They totally changed because they got to the point where they, they don't have to worry about money anymore, but now they get to do their passion. But I think if you can align those two, uh, it's going to work out better. Um, so yes, um, if you are doing DevRel just for the money, you can do that. You can satisfy your need and I'm not going to discount that, but I just realized that you might get to the point where you then have to do a severe pivot and kind of do a reset. If I'm going to give myself as an example. I've been writing code for quite some time. I reached a position that I think I want to shift to a different role. Just it is like my job that I have to do mm -hmm. and I would get to write code as a hobby. Because mm -hmm. you reach the position when you're a software developer, when you've been writing it for more than five years, you really get bored of writing code for fun. So you no longer have, let's say, the motivation to write open source uh, projects or contribute because you really got sick of writing code every single day. So my idea was like, I would want to find, let's say, a different role, let's say a managerial role, product management, or I become, let's say, like a technical product management. 
and then mm-hmm. I would keep on writing code for fun because I love doing it. Right. But that's also so some... going back to that like technical, um, uh, technical community manager part. You're explaining things in terms of defined names. Those are solutions. But what is the problem that you're solving that you need to unravel to figure out? You're like those are the solutions to a problem that you're not clearly articulating. Is the problem only you don't want to write code? Or is the problem is you're that's in the negative, but what is the positive problem or thing that you're the solution that you're trying to look for? Are you looking for more variety? Are you looking for more control? Are you looking for more direction? Or are you looking for more flexibility? Like those are the things that if you really think about it, you could figure out that there may be a solution that doesn't have a name. Like people were doing DevRel before DevRel had a name. I was doing social media management and marketing before that had a name. Don't be afraid to do the things that move you to the place of ultimate happiness or fulfillment, even if it doesn't have an exact title. And if, let's say, for example, if I want to do this certain thing that I love doing, but still I have to, based on the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I still need to satisfy myself to be able to survive. Eventually you have to do something to put bread on the table and then you have to do the things that you want to love. Mm -hmm. So this is why shifting, let's say, from writing code to a role that is not writing code, I would consider it as like my day job. I might hate it. I might not like it, but it puts food on the table. But I would come back home and I would have the enough motivation. And I'm going to say this. I would want to write code because I love doing it, not because I'm forced Mm -hmm. to be working to get paid to put bread on on the table. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as long as you do the self-discovery, right? You make sure that you understand that you are making a choice. Uh, I think some people feel like they don't have a choice, especially in some uh, uh, where their parent tells them they, that in order to be successful, you have to do X, Y, Z, or you have to go to this university. Um, understanding that the choice is one that you're making. But like I said, as long as you keep shifting towards the thing that is the gravity of what pulls you, I think eventually you get to the point where You'll have the skill set and the refinement and the, the either the financial wherewithal or the the security to be able to move forward into that. So uh, I bet if let's say you want to do less coding, your next job, you're going to know this about yourself and see what uh, an employer that gives you the opportunity to do less coding and something else is going to be more attractive than the one that pays a little bit more, but it's only coding. And so knowing that you're making a conscious choice uh, about which you're going to choose based on your circumstances and what your needs are, when you get to the point where you, as you change jobs, you're probably gaining more skills, gaining more um, resume, like affirmation that you're, that you can be successful, that you're able to be more discerning about where you're going to go. Just that as you move each tier up or as you progress, as long as you're shifting towards a thing that eventually will be more consistent to what you ultimately want to do, um, I I think is the the right way to go. So I'm going to shift to a different question, which is, does having certain certifications play a role in getting a DevRel job? Like, let's say, for example, AWS certifications might give you, let's say, a qualification for getting a DevRel job at AWS? Depends on the role, depends on the manager. I don't have any AWS certifications at this moment. I have six. Yeah. So look, look where we are. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I, there's, there's, it, there are things that are core to the role that is related to, to having the, those certifications. And some not. I did have like, uh, like a, an A plus certification back in the day. <laughs> like, I, I mean, uh, I was a Microsoft. Um, uh, I had a not an MVP. Was it M M. MSP or Microsoft certified MCP. I was an MCP for Microsoft as well. Um, and so, yes, possibly. Um, it all depends on the role. It depends on the hiring manager and how much they know. Um, I think people who have a good inter, 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 um, interview style or vetting process can determine which is book knowledge and which is application knowledge. And I think application knowledge trumps book knowledge uh, a lot of the time um, because things change, especially on the book knowledge. There's new iterations, there are new versions, and you have to be able to move 
through that from a way that understands the, the fundamentals and the core. Um, and some certifications give you that, some don't. Um, but uh, a base knowledge is something that you can prove and it's useful, but not universally so, but it's also not universally not useful. It, it, it's a very situational based. So I always end the podcast with a mental health question. It's something that I always do, which is, have you ever faced burnout or imposter syndrome? And if you did, what do you do to resolve towards those issues? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Especially in 2020, when the pandemic started. Um, <laughs> and this is going to sound like repetitive, but I use that time to kind of take a step back and really look inward to understand not only what I was good at from a my voice perspective, um, rather than what I was good at from an other's voice perspective. Like there are things that people tell you and then there's things that you know um, and how you determine how you know things um, from kind of like understanding how other people operate. So you can put yourself in context in contrast to how you operate and think about the things that you aren't necessarily bad at as negatives, but just accept them as a way of being. Like those are things that just is a description of how I am. When you play like a character on a video game, sometimes there's a, a healer that's really good at lifting other people up, making sure that they can keep doing what they're doing, but their attack might be very, very low. And then there's those that are the opposite, the people who are really good at attack, but then they really don't help their supporting cast members. It doesn't mean there's something bad about them. Uh, it just means that they are, uh, they understand their role and it's the assembling of that group, that cast, that team that is really, really important. And so once you do that self-reflection and understanding, you can see what teams that you really can enhance and that have like a use size hole in it so that when you fill it, you feel not only supported, but you feel that it's a place where you belong. And so that was one of the, that's some of the work that I did to kind of like make it feel as if I wasn't someone that was destructive or chaotic in, in, in a, a more universal way, but more like if you put me in a place where I don't fit, I'm going to be rubbing different parts wrong and other parts are going to rub me wrong. And so it doesn't mean that I'm wrong. It just means that I'm in the wrong spot. And that's one of the things that kind of helped me reflect and make better choices. So in short terms, you became aware of yourself. Yes. And more aware of my surroundings and more, uh, place more emphasis of doing due diligence before accepting a role. Uh, before is like, did I get an offer? The answer is yes. Then I took the role. It's more like vetting it to make sure that it is the right role for me. What I usually do is I write, the, I write on a journal like every single day. I've been doing it for you for, I think four years. I'm on journal 11. Oh, that's awesome. Oh yeah. Feed that into chat GBT. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to feed that into chat GBT. I, I write them <laughs> through fountain pens. Uh, I, I take it very seriously every single day, mm. but the reflection of, let's say I want to take a decision. I would trace back old pages. I would see this is the right decision to take, or it's not the right decision. I monitor mm -hmm. myself to the point I see if, okay, this thing throughout time might be affecting me. Maybe I should solve this specifically. I need to find a solution for it. Or if this thing is bothering me, I need to find something about it mm -hmm. where you gain consciousness of the things, because there are times where you're going to be aware and there are times where you're not going to be fully aware. So you're basically writing it for when you're not aware when you are aware, so you can become a little bit more aware. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I... Thank you so much for listening to the episode. If you liked it, then feel free to watch our previous episodes and feel free to follow us on social media and rate us on your favorite podcast app of choice.